This morning I'm doing something just a little bit different. Uh, I will be traveling next week, so I don't want to launch us back into Matthew and then have to take a break. So we'll pick back up in Matthew's gospel when I return, uh, which will be the following Sunday. So I wanted to just uh, really sort of consider a, a one-off message and, uh, and really to do so in light of everything that's happening with Harvest Bible Church right now. One of the questions that I have received many, many times from people over the years, ever since we planted this church in 2013, people always say to me, well, are you growing? They always ask me that question. And truthfully, I never really know how to answer the question uh, because uh, even though I know what they're asking me, they're asking me, well, how many people do you have? That's what they want to know. But there's a lot of metrics to consider when you talk about growth. And even on outward metrics, you're talking about things like attendance or membership or new converts or baptisms or whatever it may be. And while these are all factors to consider, they really aren't the most important things when we consider church growth. Well, how so? Well, I mean, for starters, any one of these things can be manipulated. For example, you can drive up attendance by employing all kinds of gimmicks to get people in seats. I could, I could tape $5 bills underneath every seat and say, all right, anybody who wants to come gets five bucks and fill the church that way. And there are, sadly, there have been churches that have done things like that to get people to show up. We could broaden or lower the standard of membership, not to be plausible confession of faith, but general affinity for the church. In other words, membership could be more like, I like it here, versus I belong here because Christ saved me. And that's what happens in a lot of churches, especially up in New England, is that whatever church you're closest to in terms of proximity, well, that's the one that you join, regardless of what you believe. We could also manipulate conversion numbers by coercing people into making emotionally charged professions of faith. We could do altar calls and get people all wound up and have them confess something that they may or may not believe. But nothing that I'm describing to you constitutes real church growth. 1 Corinthians 3.6 affirms that it's actually God who grows the church. God is the one who's at work. God is the one who draws people to the local assembly. God is the one who changes hearts and gives people new life in Christ. He's the one who compels them to profess faith and seek membership and pursue baptism and grow in godliness. He's the one who does it. We are merely the recipients and the encouragers of such things. Now again, membership or numbers, I should say, numbers may point to spiritual realities, but what really matters is whether or not God is affecting spiritual change at this church in the midst of a a healthy situation. In fact, that's far more important for us to consider. And so lately when people have come up to me and they've seen external changes here, they've seen a lot of things happening in this church, they'll, they'll say, well, why do you think things are happening at your church? Why are you growing? And the thing is, I always scratch my head. I'm like, I don't know why people come and join this church. I mean, I have an idea of why, but truthfully, it is the Lord who's doing something here. But my answer has generally been this, and I think this is correct. I think there are two spiritual realities that we have to consider, and that is the reality that this church, I believe, possesses two things, truth and love, truth and love. And in my estimation, healthy churches must have these two things going for them, truth and love, and you need both. Because here's the thing, you can have truth and no love, and you'll become a theologically sound church, but you'll have cold members who will not care for each other. And churches that do this will eventually shrivel up because they drive away those people who they're supposed to be loving. And those churches will eventually shrink down to a a small, intimate, frozen chosen. If you have love and no truth, on the other hand, you develop warm friendships, you like each other, you have a nice time together, but you don't manifest any true biblical unity because nobody knows what they believe anymore. These churches eventually, however, apostatize and fall away from the faith because they don't understand, they don't know in whom they have believed. And so you need both. You need truth and love. And so what does it look like when God grows a church by these things? Well, in our time today, I want to look at the church in the book of Acts and take note of what we see. And it's my hope this morning that you will find encouragement as we consider what God is doing in the life of our own church. And so turn over to Acts chapter 2 with me. Acts chapter 2 in your copy of Scripture. 
People go to Acts 2 for lots of reasons. They look for principles and formulas for church growth and church planting. I've been to workshops where they do a, an Acts 2 seminar on how to get your church bopping, how to break the 200 barrier and all those different kinds of gimmicks. But I, what I want to do is I just simply want to look at what the text says and, and, and understand what this first gathering was all about and just look around at what we see here. The tail end of Acts chapter 2 brings us to the end of a long discourse which has seen the arrival of the Holy Spirit at the beginning of Acts chapter 2, Peter's first evangelistic sermon, and then the widespread repentance of the listening audience. Now, at this point, the Spirit is convicting people of their sinfulness. He is granting them saving faith in Christ. And then we see the Lord gathering all these people together into one place, and that becomes the church. And so that's where we pick it up in Acts chapter 2, we're going to look at verse 41 all the way to the end of the chapter. Acts 2.41. This is after the sermon, after the repentance, and so we see verse 41. So then, those who had received his word, Peter's word, were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as any might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God And having favor with all people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now remember that the events of Acts chapter 2, they take place in Jerusalem. So this is, this is happening in Jerusalem and Israel during the, the feast of, uh, around Pentecost, the feast of weeks. And there could have been upwards of a million people in the city. So when you think about a million people in a large city at this point, uh, a few thousand really isn't a large number in comparison. But for a church gathering to go from 120 to 3,000 in one day is quite a thing, isn't it? And so Peter, he preaches to the crowd, the Lord saves 3,000 people, and immediately these people are added to the church. Now, considering that the church, again, according to Acts 115, only consisted of 120 people up to that point, this is a radical change. 3,000 new believers in one, in one day, that's a 2,400% growth, if you can imagine that. I tried to do the math for what would happen if that ever happened here, and my brain hurt, so I stopped doing it. But you get the idea. This is a large amount of growth in one short amount of time, but that's what God does here. That's what he does to really launch and begin to grow the church. And then we see in verse 42, we get a glimpse of what their gatherings were actually like. And we note several key components here of this divinely revived gathering. The first thing we notice here is biblical teaching. Biblical teaching, verse 42. We read that the members were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. What is the apostles' teaching? Well, in short, the apostles' teaching is the apostles, their encapsulation of Christ's teaching, and Christ's teaching embraced and expounded on the Old Testament teaching. Now, do we have access to the apostles' teaching? Yes, we do. It's in the content of the New Testament. The New Testament encapsulates the apostles' teaching, which is that of Christ's teaching, which then expands the, the entire Old Testament. So it's the, the content of all the scriptures. And so to be devoted to the apostles' teaching is to immerse yourself in the faithful exposition and application of the Bible. Now, through what means is a church able to do this? The answer, through the ministry of pastors and teachers. Ephesians 4, 11 through 12 says that God gives gifts to the church in the form of pastors and teachers whose job it is to equip the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. In fact, there is an inherent connection between the ministry of the word and the effectiveness of the church. Remember, truth has to exist here. Therefore, pastors are called for 2 Timothy 4, 2, to preach the word, to preach the word, to be ready in season and out of season, 
When you feel like you want to, when you feel like you don't want to. It doesn't make a difference. In season and out of season. To reprove, to rebuke, to exhort with great patience and instruction. This is the chief aim of all preachers. It is our primary responsibility. Primary responsibility. Not church administration. Not coordinating events. Not mediating spats between members. Not engaging in politics. Not influencing culture. Preaching the word of God. That is my charge. And it's a serious charge. And all who would be called to this office, it's a serious charge. 2 Timothy 2.15 exhorts preachers to be diligent to present yourself approved to God as workmen who do not need to be ashamed, handling accurately or rightly dividing the word of truth. We are required by God to labor this way. Otherwise, we run the risk of being shamed by our negligence. And that's one of my concerns. It's one of my fears when I don't have enough time or I don't devote enough time to doing my job. I fear the shame of not being able to accurately and rightly divide the word of God. Furthermore, James 3.1 warns, let not many of you become teachers, brethren. Why? Knowing that such will incur a stricter judgment. It's amazing. Lots of people fancy themselves to be teachers, and I've seen it all over the place. One of my pastors growing up, I remember when I was getting excited about ministry, he looked at me one day, he says, you know, there's always somebody younger gunning for your pulpit. And he was talking about me. And he says, everybody thinks you can, that you can do my job. He goes, but you wait till you have to do it. It's hard. And I was like, oh, it'll be fine. You know, oh, it's hard. <laughs> but he's right. You know, there's always, there's always this urge to, to want to be teachers, to want to lead other people, to want to have the, the, the office and the prestige and the authority and the power, whatever you think is there. But guess what? It's actually not what it's all about. It's about slavery to God. It's about service to exposit and deliver his truth to God's people. It is a serious charge. It's a charge I take very, very soberly. But why is this such serious business? Because here's the deal. The church's devotion to biblical teaching is the primary means by which they grow. So when you receive the word of God and plant it into your mind and into your heart, the word begins to take root and, and, and grow in you and, and root up in you. And you bear fruit for God. And so this is devoted members who engage with the labors of devoted ministers. That's what we see laid out for us at this point. They are devoted to the apostles' teaching. But we also see a devotion to fellowship here in verse 42, and even more specifically to the breaking of bread. Now, some commentators have said, well, that could either be fellowship and having meals together, or it could be the Lord's table. I tend to think, just based on context, he's talking about fellowship. Fellowship, breaking bread together, having meals together. This Greek word translated fellowship is koinonia. Koinonia, and refers to something that is shared in common. It's where believers are united together in the name of Christ and engaging in a common life, a a bonding, a devotion to kinship. We see the first church engage in this way. If you look at verses 44 and 45, it says, All those who had believed were together and had all things in common. That's koinonia, all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as any might have need. And so, look at this, they're caring for each other. They're they're giving to each other. They're meeting tangible needs. And then we see in verses 46 and 47, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart and praising God and having favor with all people. And so we see this this unity, this gladness, this sincerity and praise and thanksgiving. All of this is characteristics of Christian fellowship. And so if devotion to the apostles' teaching demonstrates the commitment to truth, then the devotion to the fellowship is the component of love, isn't it? We're supposed to be loving each other and caring for each other in tangible ways. And then verse 42 mentions one more element of their devotion. They were devoted to prayer, which you could also include, I believe, in truth and love because prayer is on behalf of other other people who you love, but it's also to the Lord who you worship and serve in truth. Doesn't, isn't that what Jesus says in John 4.24, that we worship God, we worship him in spirit and truth. 
And so prayer really encapsulates all of this, but a, a healthy church is always devoted to prayer. Praying for the members, praying for the leaders, praying for the lost, praying for their governing authorities. We are called in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 to pray without ceasing. We ought not to forget to do this as the early church was devoted to it. Now, this passage is not a formula for church growth. It's not like if you add all these components up together, you're just going to get a healthy church. That's not what this is all about. But rather, it's telling of the story of the first church and how, through the midst of all of these things, the Lord was adding to their number those who are being saved. Through these elements here, the Lord was the church, and he did so for his own glory. Well, the question is, well, how much did he grow the church? This is very interesting. Acts 2.41 says that God added 3,000 souls in the wake of Peter's sermon, but then we see by Acts chapter 4, verse 4, the church is now up to 5,000 people. Just a short bit later, God is growing this devoted church through their commitment to truth and love and prayer, but also through another means, through persecution. By Acts chapter 4, the religious leaders of Israel, they are angered because the disciples are teaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so what do they do? They arrest Peter and they arrest John. They try them. They threaten them. And then by Acts chapter 5, they beat them and they persecute them. But the church continues to grow in the midst of all of this. And so, beloved, don't be surprised when persecution comes to this church I think sometimes we get anxious about that. Oh, no, I hope they don't persecute us. Well, they're going to. They're doing so in small ways now, but it's going to increase, especially if this church continues to grow in number and in effectiveness. They will persecute us. And so don't be surprised. And I would even add to that, don't be surprised when they try to shut us down again next year. And they will try. And I would even add to this and let you know that the elders are committed to keeping the doors open at all costs. We are not going to shut down on order of the government, again, that a healthy, growing church is a persecuted church. It always has been. By Acts chapter 5, we also see the first case of church discipline of Ananias and Sapphira. They lie to the church, they lie to the Lord about the gift they had given, and they're punished by death. The Lord strikes them dead in the midst of the assembly, if you can imagine that. Shocked everybody. Acts 5.11 says, Great fear came upon the whole church. The deaths of Ananias and Sapphira demonstrated that God is serious about sin and cares about holiness. But did that slow the growth of the church? Not in the least. Acts 5.14 says that multitudes, multitudes of men and women were being constantly added to their number. And so a healthy Growing church is serious about sin and holiness and is committed to church discipline. Yet, the first church kept on growing in the Lord. We read about this in Acts 5.42. Despite opposition, despite threats from the local government, it says that every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So they didn't buckle under threats They didn't buckle under persecution. They just kept on preaching Jesus. Again, we see this steadfast commitment to building up the church in truth. But then the problems begin. Because up to this point, you're thinking, well, they're preaching Christ. They're growing like crazy. They're committed to love and fellowship. And they're enduring persecution. It's pretty noble. But then a bunch of stuff starts happening. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. And so now we see the complaints arise. We see them sort of looking at this. this there's, two, there's two groups in the church. There's, there's the Jews and there's the Gentiles and we're not being treated fairly and there's all these problems now within the gathered assembly. What happens? How do the apostles respond? Look at verse 2. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. 
Now, I want to make something very clear. They didn't, they didn't disregard the needs of the church. They didn't say, oh, that's not important. We're going to go back to preaching. They didn't, they didn't disregard. They solved the problem. But they did so because they're under a divine mandate that they have to be committed to the ministry of the word and to prayer. Verses 5 through 7. This statement found approval with the whole congregation. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parnamis, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. And so we see a healthy, growing church will address practical needs, but never at the expense of the ministry of the word of God. And so we see again broadly that the, a healthy church will always be devoted to two things, truth and love. Again, we won't deny the ministry of the word or diminish it, but we're also not going to neglect the very needs of the, uh, the gathered assembly. And so if we look to the example of the first church, we see a devotion to biblical teaching. We see a loving fellowship. We see fervent prayer. But again, we also see the reality of persecution and the need for church discipline, as well as a faithful response to practical problems. And so every church everywhere needs to consider these things. Now, I brought us this far, and I want to sort of pause and redirect here and make application. What about our church? And the reason I'm doing this message this way is because there has been a lot of discussion over the last months and the last year or so. People coming into my office and talking and asking questions and emails and phone calls, and there's a lot of chatter about the state of our church currently. We have seen God do amazing things in the last 10 years of ministry. And if you had been in the living room of our home at the very beginning, and you look at it from then to now, it would blow your mind. I'm still blown away by what God has done in 10 years. But I would even add to that, we've seen him do astounding things in just the last three years. Three years has been amazing. I looked back in the numbers this week. When we shut down, we, we shut down for 11 weeks during the last COVID situation. We shut down in March of 2020. When we shut down, we were approximately 100 people. And when we opened the doors 11 weeks later, it was almost as if the floodgates opened up. Whereas prior to 2020, we probably saw about three to four new families per month. But then after COVID, we started to see three to four new families per week. Things began to change. More than half of our members currently have come in the last three years. More than 40% in just the last 18 months. So we're seeing a trajectory of just numerical growth. What about regular attendance? Again, I looked at the numbers one more time. In just two years, we have more than doubled in terms of regular attendance. Whereas in April of 2021, we were at 120. Now we're at 220. Why am I talking about numbers? Didn't I just start the sermon by saying that's not a metric of true spiritual growth? Am I bragging about the numbers? No, I'm not. Rather, I mention all of this because this constitutes a radical change in this assembly over just the last couple of years. And it presents some challenges, I believe, for us to be able to assimilate new families into the assembly. And I know that many of you have seen this and, and felt this. It affects our fellowship. It affects our unity. What do I mean by that? Well, in the earlier years when the growth was slower, we were able to assimilate new families a lot easier because when one new family shows up, the whole church goes, hey, somebody new, and you bring them in, right? And it's very easy. The fellowship is, is very natural. It's easy. All your kids all get to know each other. It's very natural. But lately it has felt almost like a tidal wave of, of new faces, and I, I praise God for that. But it can feel a bit overwhelming. It's overwhelming for all of you who are relatively new. You walk in, you don't know anybody. That's overwhelming. I think church, when you have to go and try to find a new church, that's one of the most difficult things in the Christian life. Our family's done it a couple times. It's so hard because you go and you're thinking, okay, is this going to be my, my new church family, my, those who I'm going to love and minister with? Am I going to just love these people with all my heart and, and die? Am I going to die here? Is this going to be where, I, where my casket comes down? 
or am I just going to have to leave in two weeks because I find some major doctrinal problem? That's a very unnerving thing, and I don't take that lightly. And so if this has been your experience of, of being overwhelmed coming in, and we appreciate that, and we want to encourage you. But again, this is exciting. And rest assured, God is doing a new thing here, and we're all, all of us are doing our best to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. However, as I consider this newer season of the life of our church, I am met with a couple of pastoral concerns. And I want to share those concerns with you because I think the Bible says to don't hide things in the darkness, expose them and talk about things openly. I think that my hope is that this is going to be helpful and instructive for you. And so here's two pastoral concerns, at least that I have. The first has to do with the potential for divisions. The potential for divisions. I was reading in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul, he addresses the Corinthian church who were claiming, some people were claiming to be of Paul or of Apollos or of Cephas or of Christ. They were dividing themselves up by their affinity. And Paul, when he saw this, he put a stop to it immediately. And such a, such a radical shift even here, it's very easy for us to look around and say, well, well we're, we're pre-COVID or we're first five years or we're first year, or we're, we're the original planters. Well, I've been here longer than all of you, so I got you beat. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but isn't it easy for us to do that? To segment ourselves by, by seniority? And I've seen other churches do it too. We've been, we, when we visited other churches and were members of other churches, we saw similar problems. We were part of a church not too long ago that went from 80 to 425 in five years. And they had substantial challenges to unity and growth. Or even the temptation for us to break up harvest into two churches, the old and the new. I would ask you this question, has Christ been divided? Are we not all brothers and sisters in the Lord? And when Christ returns, will he not come for us all? He doesn't care how many months or days or years you've been here. That's not a, that's not a factor in his mind. And so this isn't a matter of old church versus new church. This is Christ's church. And we have to remember that as we live and move and operate here. But yet I still want to speak to people's experience because I know this is a real thing. If you have been here for a while and you maybe consider yourself an an older member of the church, you've been here for a couple years or whatever it may be, maybe you're feeling overwhelmed. Maybe you, you used to know everybody and now you're just struggling to get people's names right. Maybe you feel like you're losing the small, close-knit family that you used to have. But let me encourage you that you haven't lost a thing. And you're not losing anything. In fact, I would even add that you're gaining family. You're gaining brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers and children and friends. And after all, did we not pray for God to grow this church? Did we not pray for conversions and new ministries? We've had 17 baptisms in the last three years. Did we not pray for this in the early years? And so when God delivers, praise him for it. Rejoice that he's kept his promise to grow the church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And so don't worry about what's happening. Don't be anxious. Don't be worried about this. Instead, reach out. Introduce yourself. If you don't know somebody, just walk over, introduce yourself. Yeah, but I'm an introvert. Well, I know. Do it anyway. Do it anyway. Invite people over to your house. Invite them over to your house. Set up play dates for your kids. If you see other children that look about the same age as your kids, go ahead and set up a date for them. Many of you are already doing this, and I praise the Lord for that. I'm seeing this happening in our congregation, and I I praise the Lord for that. And I would just encourage you, remember the kindness that was shown to you when you were new and extend that to other people as well. Now, what if you're newer to Harvest Bible Church? Maybe you're also feeling overwhelmed, as I mentioned. Maybe you feel like, well, I just don't quite fit in. But let me encourage you, you will. You will. Give it time. And know that virtually every other person, one out of two, is relatively new, so you're in good company with them as well. Again, 100 people in two years, it's a large difference. It's a big change. So you're looking around the room thinking, well, I'm new here, and they're looking at you saying, I don't know you either, like everybody's new. So embrace that, and I would encourage you to step outside yourself, outside your comfort zone, and just walk up and introduce yourself. 
You never know what's going to happen. And I would even also add, be patient with other people. And I want to caution you, beloved. I want to caution you away from coming into an assembly and trying to steer harvest toward your own preferences. And that's a risk that can happen. Instead, I want to encourage you this way. Spend your time learning the church's DNA and culture and make friends here. Get involved, get to know people and learn what we do and why we do it. There's a reason things have been going a certain way. Learn what that is. And then when fellowship and trust grow, you'll be part of positive changes and growth moving ahead. But I would just encourage you, please be patient. Hang in there with us. We're all growing together, so be patient. We need to do all that we can to grow together and resist division. Resist division. We don't want divisiveness in this church. And I would tell you, this is one of Satan's tools. He will, he will bring people and arguments and practices and all kinds of things to try to mess this up. Don't be ignorant to his schemes. Instead, resist that, resist division, and seek to pursue uh, fellowship and love and growth. Get to know people. That's my first concern and exhortation. A second pastoral concern has to do with the fact that we need to be guarding our hearts from creeping sins. Guarding our hearts. And as the elders and I interact with you all, we've definitely noticed an array of responses over the last couple years to what's been going on. And I just want to speak to a few. This is one of those situations where if the shoe fits, wear it. If it's not, then don't worry about it. But I want to speak to a few different things that we're seeing. There are those of you who are excited about what's going on. And you're happy. You're happy with what's happening here. Every Sunday is exciting. You're chomping at the bit. And you want to see more growth and more change and more things happening. But I want to encourage you to be patient and keep on plodding along. Because if you're not patient, what's going to happen is that you will grow disenfranchised and eventually you'll go rogue. And I see it all the time. I would also add to dial in to the areas of need that we currently have. There's about a 25 ministries that we want to see happen in the future, but we have to stabilize the base right now. And so if you see areas of need right now, engage in those areas if you're excited and wait in the Lord. Things are happening even if it's not evident to you right now. There's a lot going on. I also want to speak to those of you who are distracted. Those of you who are distracted. These days there's so many things that are fighting for our attention and our allegiance. And I want to caution you away from chasing causes and chasing movements and fads. There's even movements within Reformed evangelicalism that really are nothing more than gospel distractions. Don't fall for them. Instead, I want to encourage you to be devoted to this assembly. Devote yourself to spiritual growth. Use this season of your life to grow spiritually, to engage in body life. The world's falling apart. This place is not. So engage here where Christ is. Get to know people. Engage in the fellowship. Make friends. Practice evangelism. COVID has said, you know, you know we're, we're not going to talk to anybody. We're not going to be around anybody. That's against the gospel mandate. Now, you can be creative with how you do it. And I understand. And I'm, please hear me. If someone is sick, we need to minister as though they're sick. And if there are people who have to stay home for a short bit of time, we understand that. We don't want people who are sick bringing sickness into the assembly. If you have a fever, stay home, my goodness. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this aversion to people, an isolation. That's of the enemy. Don't isolate yourself. Reach out, make friends, and tell people about Christ because he's the only hope this world has. Work on your marriage. Use this season of your life to work on your marriage. Make it strong. Train your children in the Lord. Don't allow yourself to be distracted, but instead be devoted, as Acts 2.42 says, to the things of God, to biblical teaching, to fellowship, and to prayer. I also want to speak to those of you who are anxious right now. So much anxiety going on. You may be anxious about what's happening in the church or in the state or in the world. Maybe you're worried about government overreach or the economy, or COVID, or the election, or education, or whatever it may be. Lots of things to be anxious about in this world. 
But let me encourage you to practice trusting in the Lord and know that he is sovereign over all things. He is sovereign. He is our Lord. Did we not read Psalm 8 this morning? Over all creation. And so I would encourage you, get busy learning and serving and loving other people. And guess what? You'll find that you don't have time to be anxious about your life. As Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, don't be anxious about tomorrow. You don't even know what tomorrow is going to bring. Just focus on what you have to do today and trust the Lord. Trust him. He is worthy of our trust and of our faith. And finally, I want to speak to those of you who are struggling with discontentedness. Maybe you're discontented. Maybe things at church are not happening the way that you would like or maybe at the speed that you would like. And I would just caution you to be very careful. Be careful. Because discontentedness always leads to grumbling and complaining. It always leads to gossip and slander. And I don't need to remind you what God did to the Israelites when they spent their time grumbling in the wilderness. But I know that it can be a challenge. I understand. I, get, I struggle personally being discontented when I don't see things going my way. But especially if you're struggling to understand why leadership is not doing the things that you think that we should be doing. And so, if you'll permit me, I'd like to share with you what the leadership of this church have been doing. Now, why am I doing this? Well, the Apostle Paul does it. In his letters, he gives a defense of his ministry in many places. And so, I want to do this. I think this would actually be helpful. It's my desire to be helpful and encouraging to you and give you a window into what's actually going on behind the scenes. So, since January, nine months, since January, we've moved into a new building. We've hired and trained a new church administrator, Jody, who has herself virtually revised every single process and document, and we've had to oversee that and work with her on that. We've appointed a new elder in the last nine months. We've appointed two deacons. We've overseen and aided the launch of five new ministries, including lower youth, hospitality, financial ministry, and mom's ministry in lower junior church, along with several more ministries that are on the way. We have revamped considerably several ministries. We've been working with the homeschool ministry, helping prayer ministry to revamp, the meal train ministry, men's ministry, Sprouts nursery ministry as well. We've interviewed and welcomed 14 new members since January with 22 potentially on the way, those who've taken classes already. We've also been rewriting our core documents, the statement of faith, the church bylaws and church covenant. We're also working with the deacons to see that the building is actually finished to legal occupancy. We're still missing a couple things here. And we're also working to try to get to the point we can pay off the construction loan that we owe very soon. We've also been working to identify and identify and train new elders, which in many cases takes years, my friends. We need new elders. Of course we do, but it takes time. We're also working on the next steps for a new staff hire. All of this and more with the additional challenge that we lost a pastor in February. I think it's easy to forget that. But I want to encourage you. The elders have stepped up. They've endured three-hour meetings on a regular basis. Our elders' meetings go long into the night. Countless emails, texts, phone calls. Beloved, you need to know that your lay elders and deacons are good men who love you. They really do love you. So be encouraged. We're working hard, as hard as we can, to meet the needs here at this church. And we would covet your prayers and your encouragement and grace and patience. And so don't let your heart become discouraged or dis- disenfranchised. Instead, join us in the efforts because God is doing something at this church. Other people come in and they, see, they walk around, they see what's going on, visitors, and they come up to me afterwards and they say, there's something going on here. I'm like, I know. There's something, this is not normal for Gilmanton, New Hampshire. This is not normal for New England. I'm serious. So recognize that God is doing something and praise him. Seriously, praise him. Because we are called to pursue unity and peace with one another. We are one church, one church. And we are called to labor and love and be devoted to one another and to him. And what is the basis of our unity? What do we have in common? Beloved, we have Christ in common. He is our Christ. The Christ who came to earth, who was born of a virgin, lived a sinless, flawless life. As the old creed says, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was dead and buried, and yet he rose from the grave on the third day, 
and ascended to heaven where he sits at the right hand of God Almighty. And all of us who have trusted in Christ alone, we've been given the Spirit who dwells in us, each one of us. And he is the one who unites us together. He is the one who strives with us. He helps us so that we might love each other. And every single Christian believer in this room, 10 years, 10 minutes, all of us, we share of the same spirit. We all have the same common confession of Christ. All of us have a testimony of his grace and his mercy to us. And so don't overlook that. Let us love one another. Let us love one another and glorify God together. Let us commit ourselves and devote ourselves to loving him and being committed to the truth of the word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have done amazing things, and you are worthy to receive all glory. This church is not this church because of me, because of the core planters, because of the leadership, because of the membership, Lord. This church exists, and this church is growing because you have seen fit to bring something here and do something in this assembly. So, Lord, help us not to become arrogant, not to become prideful, not to become boastful, to think that somehow we are the reason. You, O oh Lord, are the one who is working. You set up a lampstand, and you're the one who takes it away. All of us belong to you. We are your possessions. You own all of our souls And you have given us us gifts that we are to use for this assembly. And you have prepared works for us that we should walk in them. And so, Lord, let us have the right mind about what we are to be doing. Let us resist distraction, Lord. Let us resist and, and fight against fear. Let us not do what the world is doing. But, Lord, let us also, please, help us to be sensitive to each other to be kind-hearted toward one another, to bear with each other. And Lord, if trouble comes even next year, help us to be wise, help us to be discerning, but also help us to love each other and to lift each other up, Lord. Help us not to engage in divisions, but help us to be united. Lord, we know the only way we're going to survive as a church is if you are Lord and Master in a very practical way that we submit ourselves to you, and we trust that if we do, Lord, my prayer is that you would sustain this assembly for the next century. Lord, that is my prayer. Keep believers here. Raise our children up. Give them saving faith. And then give them the mantle of leading in this assembly to honor you. And then their children, Lord, that you would pass this torch of faith to our grandchildren, that there would be a light of the gospel in Gilmanton, in New Hampshire, in New England, that this light of the gospel would not go out, but that we would be then a light to the nations, O Lord, that you would use your word and our love to set this world ablaze. You did it in Jerusalem. You can do it in Gilmanton. And so, Lord, we submit ourselves to you. We commit ourselves to you. And we devote ourselves to you. Help us, Lord, and if we have sinned against you or against each other, Lord, convict us. Convict us of our sins. And Father, I would entreat you, start with leadership. Go top down. Convict us of our sins if we have sinned against anyone here or against you. Bring about the fruit of repentance and then grow our faith that we might trust you with all of our heart. We pray this earnestly, Lord. We do all this for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen.